Here we are, live for the first Chalcedon Q&A of 2019. I'm Martin Sorbetti, I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, and uh, we're broadcasting with Chalcedon Q&A and a little meat of the word here on January 6th. This is our 62nd Q&A broadcast by my account. As usual, we take some questions up front that were uh, came in online that I uh, printed out in advance, and then we'll take the live questions. Uh, and uh, hopefully ground control will come alongside. There's Roberto, so I know that uh, folks are able to listen in. And soon we'll have ground control uh, ready to roll. So first question is an interesting one. By the way, uh, keep in mind there is a Chalcedon, the Book of the Month Club broadcast. Hello, Roberto. Uh, tomorrow on the uh, issue of the book Law and Liberty, where Chris Zimmerman is going to be uh, talking with Andrea Schwartz. Uh, Roger Oliver, glad to have you with us here today. Oh, okay. So, well, that happens. Sometimes we overlap <laughs> the Chalcedon um, Chapel session with us here. So, what can you do? We are supposed to proceed anyway. So, let's see how this goes. <laughs> Must have had a good service if it went a little bit over time. Either that or technical problems. I didn't have a chance to catch it. I was rushing myself. So, the first question. Hey, Nathan, good to have you here. Since the Bible knows no concept of treason except against the family, is there any justification for the execution of spies and traitors? And if not, do the soldiers ordered to carry out the executions, are they uh, complicit in the crime of um, murdering? In other words, someone who the Bible says should not be murdered. Now, there are 18 capital crimes in Scripture, uh, and none of those are articulated in terms of treason against the state. That's a novelty where the state has put itself in the place of God and therefore says you owe your life to the state and your allegiance to the state at, this, at the price of your life. Consequently, to do something against the state is therefore, ah, yes, there's the Zoom registration. Ground Control is uh, putting that up for the Book of the Month Club, which I uh, referenced here in the first minute. So if you haven't signed up, do. Law and Liberty, they call that Institute's Light for a reason. It's a good way to get into the material uh, without having to plow through 849 pages of Institutes. Not that you shouldn't plow through all 849, but it's easier to start uh, in the shallower end of the pool. And it's not that shallow either. It's a shorter book, but equally deep in many respects. I still, uh, there's a passage, I think around page 39, that I still think is one of the most powerful passages in all of Rosh Hashanah, and it's sitting there in the middle of uh, Law and Liberty. So here's the question about the, the uh, traitors and, and treason. And again, when the state elevates itself over God, then of course to betray God, this God the state as God, uh, it will be at the cost of your life. But under biblical law, there is no such animal as uh, a capital crime for treason against the state per se. Now, that doesn't mean that states don't try to exert this. And we know for a fact that from the point of view of Jericho, Rahab, the harlot, the whore, the prostitute, uh, she was a traitorous whore, not just a standard commercial biz doing business whore, but a traitorous whore because she sold out her country for Jehovah. Uh, but she made the right move and her family was saved through that conflagration, the destruction of Jer Jericho, and she was put into the line of genealogy to Jesus Christ himself, the savior of all mankind. So this is God's view of traitors. He integrates a known Jericho traitor into the bloodline of Christ, who we get our salvation from. The atonement on the cross is what secured the salvation for many. So that tells you a lot that God doesn't have a, a strong view about general statist views of treason. Now, the second half of the question is interesting because I wonder if there's a bad conscience in, at work with the uh, dirty work of killing a alleged traitor. In most execution cycles, there's a mix of bullets and blanks. It's not the case that every bullet, every gun or rifle has a, uh, a bullet in it. And so there's supposedly some doubt as to who did the actual killing, the fatal shot to the wound, uh, to the heart. So this indicates that, uh, as usual, on humanistic grounds, they are operate in terms of confusion. They have confusion, true confusion of face. They just don't acknowledge it. So they try to uh, eat their have their cake and eat it at the same time. They don't want to have people guilty necessarily of something that, that the conscience might say, I'm not so sure about this, but if you thought there's a good chance that the bullet in your rifle is a blank, then you didn't actually kill the executionee. 
So this tells us a lot about how modern uh, American and modern well, European, for that matter, um, execution of traitors is done. Uh, and hanging, I guess, would be a little bit more forthright. But still, we have the case where this is not a biblical, um, a biblically allowed penalty. This is humanism striking out on its own, creating uh, and wreaking havoc by framing mischief using laws, putting into place laws that are in violation of scripture, uh, and therefore creating their own ethical system and their own utopia. And their utopia is framed such that anyone who doesn't see it as a utopia needs to leave because they're polluting the utopia with their uh, traitorous conduct and treacheries. But uh, there's actually a couple of um, articles uh, by Rashtuni on the copy, topic of treason. I believe they exist in his Deuteronomy commentary. I think there's treason part one and treason part two. It was worth two stabs at it, two uh, bites at the apple, as we say, when Dr. Rashtuni dealt with the topic of treason in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Ground Control may want to go ahead and put up the link to those uh, because they're certainly instructive. If you have a copy of uh, Rashtuni's Deuteronomy, you can look it up. If you don't, then the link certainly will uh, point us to the pages that are relevant for those two chapters on treason. But the fundamental treason, of course, is to God, and then the family by implication, uh, which is uh, where adultery comes in, where that's a treason against the family, the covenant being broken with respect to the husband and the wife. Second question I thought was an rather amusing one. What do you think about New Year's resolutions? <laughs> This is uh, an opportunity to break your promises to yourself, right? Now, this is the interesting point. In Romans 1, we list covenant breakers as those who are alongside with murderers and fornicators, uh, have the wrath of God residing on them. What if you make the covenant with yourself and you break it? I guess it's not without reason that the comic strip Over the Hedge actually has every year <laughs> a sequence about going to uh, R.J. the Squirrel to get absolution and be absolved of the violated uh, resolution because people then, of course, have a guilty conscience all over again having violated the, con the, uh, the so-called resolution to do A, B, or C differently than they did the previous year to set in motion something new. Now, first point is it's happening at the beginning of the year. Uh, it's so-called fresh start. But you know something? There's no such thing as a fresh start outside of Christ in the most deepest significant sense. It's Christ who brings and God who in, um, implies true repentance, metanoia, a change of the mind, a change in direction. And that is real, and that is has a supernatural power behind it. And that sets in motion a new life in a way that a New Year's uh, resolution is only but a, fa a pale echo or a copy of it. Thank you for that. And there we have those two links on treason, part one and two. Thank you, Ground Control. The way ahead of us on the New Year, I love it. It's uh, auspicious to me to have that popping up so quickly. So uh, is there something special about the new year? Because Paul says some people esteem one day more than others, and others esteem all days alike. Of course, every single day is a day to uh, break uh, our faith and our commitment to God in some way, shape, or form, an opportunity to sin. But it's also an opportunity to overcome sin. And I think we need to therefore see each day as newly created by God for us to walk in it and to be walking with him in the day and the issues of it. Another thing about the notion of a resolution, which is to try to whip yourself up into an emotional state of self-commitment to certain priorities and standards, is this. Jesus makes the comment, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is of the devil. So a resolution actually tends to go beyond the notion of a yes and a no, or a simple, I'm going, you know, walking, a quiet commitment to yourself. I, I erred here. I am going to change my direction. When you make it an official thing, of course, and then you announce it, say, <laughs> another reason that this becomes funny, the comics have a, a field day with New Year's resolution, one of the other comics, I think it's Jumpstart, where someone always hides their resolution so no one can detect whether they broke them or not. Uh, because uh, people use that against you. So it's funny that uh, you're setting yourself up for failure with a lot of these resolutions. Now, there are other concepts of a fresh start in Scripture. There's the notion of uh, the release from debt and indebtedness every seven years. There is the old premise of the Jubilee, which is a brand new start when the economy, which would otherwise be overheated, is then uh, reset completely and everyone gets a, a fresh start. And these are economic fresh starts because God is a God of economic realities because we are creatures in the midst of a creation where there are resources that need to be worked to bring out their full 
fruition, their full capacity and potential. And so God gives us this work to do in that sense. And therefore, uh, God, realizing what's needful for us in a sinful world to prevail, these provisions are made as pressure release valves. But they function very, very differently than man's notion of a, a New Year's resolution. Man's notion of a New Year's resolution is rarely liberating per se, whereas God's resets are always liberating. Man's resolutions tend to be more confining. I often it's for a good cause. It's not the saying, well, I'm going to uh, finally get revenge on X. That's not a good New Year's resolution on any construction, uh, since, since it's the essence of vengeance, and vengeance is the Lord's uh, and is His. But the, uh, the issue is then that when God sets a reset, it is uh, geared for liberating us and freeing us to serve Him more completely. So we always fail, we always uh, fall, and I think the New Year's resolution, it's the same thing we talk about the Christmas spirit, you know, uh, uh, goodwill uh, uh, um, on earth to all men, goodwill, whatever the phrase is from the you know, Luke. But the, the notion there is that Alvin says, well, if only you had the Christmas spirit every day of the year. Well, if only we had the New Year's resolution spirit every day of the year. But you don't. Because there is the so-called long slog, and if God's not with you in that long slog and not a abiding presence in your heart and mind and soul, because you are feeding on the law of God, which then, of course, illuminates the path before your feet so you see God in it, then it's a whole different ballgame, you see. So when we have a new year, of course, we even have articles written, uh, like the upcoming Horizon Bill, I think, speaks to the promise of a new year coming. Uh, because these are milestones, birthdays mark milestones. Every year you have a birthday, so you know well, a year passed. I went from 61 to 62, say, uh, or from 8 to 9 years old, uh, mentally. And then you have uh, other issues like that that are uh, coming down the pike that are, represent these kind of milestones. Uh, weddings, deaths, funerals. Um, but God doesn't see things that way. So we need to then embrace the view of faith. Faith gives us the deeper, more true and accurate vision, Rush Dooney says. And that's an interesting point of view. When you see things through the eye of faith, that means you, you frame everything in terms of what Scripture says about it, not what you humanistically um, think about it in your own uh, sinful mind, but rather what God says, and you adhere to that, then that reshapes your assessment of the future and where we're going. Very, very powerful. So, yeah, there's a difference between the two positions. By the way, here's the other thing that I think is a concern. If you're willing and able to break promises to yourself and you are at the apex of your value system, that's bad news. That means that uh, every other promise is equally likely to be broken if you can break your promise to yourself. I think Shakespeare may have had a little something up his sleeve when he, I think the phrase was, be to your own self be true. Uh, except that we're not. We're even liars to ourselves. And I think New Year's resolutions is one interesting mechanism by which we do lie to ourselves about our intentions and things like that. Okay, there's two more questions that came in online. And we will see what we have here. Does the Bible call us to be proactive rather than reactive? I'm not sure that this is an either-or choice. If I said we're not supposed to be reactive, then I have to take out most of the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount where Christ says, if people do this, do that. Now, there's a list of reactions that are uh, articulated by the Lord Jesus. Um, you know, when people do these things to you, you're blessed. You do this, do this in response. Uh, and so now what God is providing is godly reactions to things, the proper response to something. Uh, and that's not necessarily bad. Now, when we see, when, what we mean by reactive is that we're simply being tossed about by every wind of circumstance, and that's bad enough. Certainly, it's worse to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. But if we are being tossed about by every wind of circumstance, that can uh, basically send you down the maelstrom, down uh, tunneling into the storm drain, and that's certainly not appropriate. So when we talk about that, we want to say Christians certainly have a task before them, and therefore prosecution of the task before them should be their life's purpose, you know, to serve God in this thing that they're doing. And perhaps they have several things in which they are involved deeply in serving the Christ, the living God, through their labor of their hands, which then, in fact, God will bless the work of their hands as a consequence. So uh, it's not proper to say there is no reactive component except this, that the reaction is a godly reaction. It can be godly indignation, it could be godly reconstruction, 
I don't think uh, there could be a time and season for both. After all, we are informed in Ecclesiastes 3 there's a time and purpose, uh, season for every purpose under heaven, and that would include reacting and proaction. Proacting means, of course, that we're setting out to do something. And, and if we are mindful of the things that God has called us to do, primarily building, I think we're going to be on the right track. They that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. So here we have proactive activity. We see that the nation has become a moral ruin, and our job is to rebuild the foundations in the midst of that ruin and lift it back up, God being uh, the one driving that process. Because as it happens in Zechariah 4th chapter, uh, God's seven eyes are on the plumb line, the plumb stone, the, the plumb line that determines how straight each of the temple blocks are as they're being put in position. So God's in the work, therefore we don't despise the day of small things. And that means, of course, we are being proactive and we are being led by God because God is the person who is involved in that task of reconstruction. Dr. Rashtuni would say this about the reactive thing. I don't let my enemies set my agenda for me. I think this is a huge comment of his. Uh, this is a sense in which we are, he was proactive. He says, I have these tasks to do and I'm not going to be pulled off of them in order to respond to criticism. So the critics ended up talking to an empty chair, in effect, uh, because he said, I'm not going to let them set my agenda. God's going to set my agenda, but not my enemies. My enemies will not set my agenda. So in this sense, Dr. Rashtuni is interesting in that he's saying, I'm not going to deal with the question of uh, going forward with this in, in that level. Oh, I see that we've been dropping viewers. Maybe people had, uh, we have a technical problem or there's issues on Facebook or I'm being shadow banned. Oops, it's inevitable that might have happened. So, don't let your enemy set your agenda for you. I think that's a big thing. Oh yeah, here's another point. Why we are not just going to be reactive. Because there's in, in set in motion in the creation this fundamental thing that's going on. What is it? That the thief breaks in, steals, and moth and rust destroy. So there are all these forces at work to take and steal and destroy and to derail and rust and corrode away the work of God. Therefore, we need to be on top of that at a quicker level. We must be proactive in our efforts, and God will bless that, and it will overtake the destructive elements that are also at work in the society. God's going to more bless the one man who's doing the right thing than the 20 who are off in la-la land and who capitulated to humanism, etc., etc., so because of the fact that we are not at a neutral starting point, we are not, um, what's the phrase, I, I would have phrased it. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we don't start from a standstill. It's like a running a race. It's not as if everyone on the race line, the racetrack is starting at the same place. In fact, we have a, like a headwind on us and we're starting behind the, start, the starting line. Consequently, you need to move forward with all due speed in order to overcome the effects that are against us. You know, the sin that so easily besets us is the phrase that Hebrews uses. And what is the what is the counsel for this in, say, Hebrews 12, where the phrases occur? So we don't let the let's, hands, uh, the arms lie slack at your side, rather to strengthen them and to move forward in service to God himself. So all that to say, uh, there's a lot to be said in regard to the proactive, but that doesn't mean there's a, not a such thing as a godly reaction to things. It's just that godly reaction is not the sum and total of the Christian faith. It is a part of it, and we presume a small part of it. After all, we do respond and react to God. We worship him. We bless him. We uh, labor uh, for him, for his kingdom's sake, and for what he's establishing in our hearts and the hearts of all men eventually. So that work is a legitimate work and is a reactive. It's a response. You cannot do anything other than react to the work of salvation that God imposes upon you for your benefit. So we're not proactive in respect to salvation. This also, this proactive reactive thing, comes into play with man's relationship to nature. When we talk about ecology, environmentalism, like that. Um, I think Rushdoney puts it this way, in a biblical worldview, man is to be um, passive with respect to God, but active with respect to nature. But under humanism, man is um, active with respect to God, but passive with respect to nature, under nature, and therefore nature rules over man and makes claims on man. 
And, uh, but man is control of God. He's active with regard to God and can determine and shape what God does for him and whether he even wants a God or not. So there's this big inversion that happens when you talk about the proactive, reactive thing when we speak about man's relationship to nature and God. How they relate top and bottom is determined by the proactive versus reactive issue. So in this instance, um, we are to be proactive in terms of godly dominion and stewardship over the nations, but that's under God, where we are passive with respect to him, but active with respect to nature, uh, to the creation and the stewardship. By the way, uh, if you're not familiar with the Cornwall Alliance for Stewardship of Creation, that's a wonderful group. I think it's cornwall.org, if not cornwallalliance.org. Uh, e. Calvin Beisner, Dr. Beisner, uh, heads that up. He wrote an amazing book, I think it's one of the most powerful books, called Where Garden Meets Wilderness, about the relationship of um, Christian faith to environmentalism put in a biblical thing. Ah, slipping in late from Chicagoland. Hey, Doug, good to have you here. Yeah, we got a, had a lot of goodies happen in the first uh, 10 minutes here <laughs> with a very small, tiny audience because, of course, they were still singing up at the chapel, among other things. Okay, so I think that covers the question about the proactive versus reactive. Um, it's not that we aren't reactive because, like I mentioned, the Beatitudes does cover a list of reactions to certain negative things happening to you. By the way, there's something else that's interesting. The Bible spends a lot of time on how the, what the proper reaction is to flattery because flattery is used to uh, reduce and lower our defenses uh, and it's uh, designed to wheedle in and, and set up situations that we are to be on our guard against. And so flattery is designed to reduce and... Uh, our guard and causes to lower our guard against things. Thank you, Ground Control. That's the Cornwall Alliance, Dr. Beisner's excellent work on the relationship of the creation to the Christian. And also how it is that humanists use the creation as a club to hit Christians over the head and how you fight back on that. Again, proactive because we're going to press the crown rights of Christ the King in regard to this question. All right. So uh, I think we have one final written-in question, then we can take any live questions that happen to exist in the year 2019. Would you please comment briefly on the ideology of human rights and the biblical answer to that? Thanks, from Roger Oliver. Uh, I have had a Ground Control um, supplied them, so I supplied them with a link, which will have uh, them put up, which is of a book called What's Wrong with Human Rights by um, T. Robert Ingram. It was published, uh, at least the publication date on the Amazon copies, in 1978. Uh, and Ingram points out that there's something fundamentally flawed about human rights because they're always erected on a humanistic foundation for openers. And they are continually expansive. Every time these human rights continue to expand, then the domain of liberty and freedom shrinks. And we also are framing mischief using law again. Because, uh, as Ingram rightly notates, the biblical concept is not of rights at all, but of responsibilities. And when everything is couched in terms of responsibilities, those create incipient rights. If I have a responsibility to my enemy, then my enemy then is accorded a, um, a right by implication. We even talked about this last week when the question was, well, what about um, a, a decaining in Deuteronomy 25, 1, 2, 3? And I pointed out that there's even a, some restrictions on that. For example, you could not... the, the the, that's not the word cane, but the, um, to be uh, struck with the rods, it says you, you, you could not do it to the point where your brother would be despised in your eyes. And, and uh, let me get the exact wording so we have it, because there was a requirement being placed upon that and a restriction that is fascinating to me, and it actually impinged on what the judge could or couldn't do. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lest thy brother be seem violent to thee. So... It is a restorative thing and not a punitive um, punishment to, to uh, put someone in the worst possible light. That's not what the intention was. It was purely a constructive step taken for correction and not in any way, shape, or form to men render them vile. And if the uh, circumstance was that the judge who was presiding over this uh, failed the test to see that they wasn't to that point of being vile in their brother's eyes, then that punishment then would fall on the judge. So it's in the judge's best interest to follow along with these restrictions. So the point there is that the responsibility of the judge protected and ensured there was a right to not being seen as vile in their fellow Israelis' eyes of the person who was judged worthy of stripes. And there was a limitation on stripes, a maximum of 40, but sometimes there was one or two administered. Sometimes they were principial in the sense that they uh, had a symbolic effect more than they had anything else. Um, uh, the intention, again... 
very, very different. So the protections created, in essence, a right, but they were because it was a responsibility of the judge to see a certain thing occurred is what, by implication, created the right. But the right is always anchored in responsibility to God and his requirements. When they are anchored in humanism, then the rights float free of any ethical foundation. They become, every man has is born with uh, these rights, uh, and these rights can be multiplied, so now you can say, I have a right to have a particular gender pronoun used for me, and I can sue you for a million dollars if you don't use it. Now, my right then supersedes your free speech right. So what happens then, of course, is that when mankind insists upon his rights, ideology of human rights, and then enforces it, that means the enforcing agency is here at the level of all our of the human level, the human place, not over here and uh, above us over with God, you have the ultimate authority now resting here at the human level. And so when that happens, as Rashtuni points out, uh, then the ultimate power is not ult up here over us. It is proximate near us. It's breathing down our necks, and it crowds out all liberty and freedom. So the way that human rights are actually couched humanistically continues to snip away and reduce human freedoms. Uh, also, they don't protect in the way that this, in the sense that they do. They create bitter, deep resentments as well. Because uh, it's not that we're inculcating responsibility like the Bible does. We're inculcating, I get mine, my rights. I stand on my rights. I want my rights to be enforced. I want the state, and then I have to have an enforcing agent. You see, with responsibilities, God's the one who sees that through. But with rights, now you have to call to the state to say, protect my right to um, uh, abort this kid. You know, protect my right to X, Y, and Z and these various sins. So you can protect a whole host of sins. Uh, by uh, determining that and declaring them by state fiat that they're human rights. And this is generally what happens. Because once you open the door to say rights are uh, radiate and emanate from the human being outward, the human, that the problem there, of course, is what Jeremiah says, that the heart of man is wicked and desperately, uh, uh, corrupt and desperately wicked above all things who can know it. Uh, and obviously, therefore, uh, all the pollutions that arise out of the human heart then become entrenched as so many human rights that cannot be abridged, and therefore we blot God out of the entire picture. And to the point of view, when you do block God out like this, he does not stay contained. He shatters all the attempts to cage him in and block him. Uh, he has control over the weather, the crops, the work of our hands. He can put a draught upon all those three things, including the work and labor of our hands, according to the book of Haggai. So uh, it is risky to go the way of the transgressor, because the way of the transgressor is hard, the scripture declares. And so human rights, as humanistically um, couched today, as the UN tries to put them forward, uh, they're designed to, of course, set God's law aside and to assert uh, the power of the state to be the protector and the God that sees that all your rights are handled. In the meantime, of course, your liberties are gone because liberties entail responsibilities. So in Scripture, Scripture promotes responsibility that liberty might be maximized. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the Spirit of the Lord inculcates and teaches us there's but to be responsible to these things, to labor with our hands, to do these things, to walk according to God's law. This makes us uh, trees that are planted by rivers of water, that uh, are fruitful, that deliver our leaf in season, and will never wither, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as Psalm 1 points out. And, uh, but that's not the way that the human rights system works. And Ingram's book does a tremendous service in laying all this stuff forth uh, and showing what the implications are of what's wrong with the doctrine of human rights, at least as humanistically conceived. Do we not have certain rights? Yes, but they don't come from man. They don't come from molecules in motion evolved up from scum. They come from being made in the image of God. And therefore, they are also um, articulated and shaped and framed and limited by what God says. Uh, that means that things like the non-aggression principle that libertarianism points to as their primary uh, modus operandus uh, has limitations. It is not able able to give us the full suite of liberties that biblical law does, simply because they've absolutized something at the expense of everything that God requires to see it. You cannot have the fruit without having, of course, the root that bears the fruit. Okay. Good stuff. Okay, let me pin this comment that came from Diane. 
A local 63-year-old woman who is single by divorce for many years is currently still working as a substitute teacher, having trouble making her financial obligations. She is borrowing money from other Christians. She states that she still tithes at her church. May she be absolved from tithing if she has to borrow. Uh, that is an interesting question. We know that the widow in Luke, not Luke, Mark 10 or 11, um, who put in the two mites, she gave all that she had. Now, of course, she wasn't necessarily borrowing from it, but the fact that she was in such a bad street and still tithed and gave to the um, temple is indicative that um, she, what little she had, she was willing to give. And Jesus said, you know, everyone else gives out of their abundance, but she out of her substance of what is necessary for her livelihood. So she gave more than all the rest combined. Now, uh, I certainly am, don't want to dissuade someone who wants to give to God. There are certain times, of course, when God says, no, you cannot give to me. David wanted to give a temple, a house for God. And, and Nathan even told him prematurely, that sounds like a good idea, go ahead and build it. And God told Nathan, I didn't authorize that. You, I'm gonna, you're going to walk that back to David and tell him, no, I'm going to have your son build the house. You're a man of war and bloody hands. I'm going to have Solomon build my house for you. So Nathan had to come back and say, I spoke prematurely and um, presumptuously. So it's not always true that when we have a good thing that we want to offer God, that God's necessarily going to receive it the way we think uh, he, he ought to. He might decline it, and, he has, and God has good reasons for anything he does, positive or negative, right? So that's, that's important. There's another interesting uh, link that Ground Control put up, predestination versus human rights, which uh, sheds additional light on the question that came in. So I'm not sure we want to talk about absolved, per se, because, of course, she has no increase. Um, well, she does, but now she's trying to service the loans and to tithe to God, and she, therefore, is in a very, very bad spot. Uh, perhaps let me speak with someone who has a known growing ministry to widows and see if uh, he cannot provide something useful to Diane, to your person, I will uh, private message you, uh, and him, I'll private message him first, and I'll uh, copy that link that you provided there, slip it to him, and I want him, his name to become public at the moment. Uh, I have reasons for that, because I can't have him in, in suddenly in uh, a flood of, you know, 50,000 widows suddenly on top of him when he's working one at a time, uh, and he's done quite a lot of work with them, but it's not a, a rapid process thing, and nor can he take a flood. So I'll see if he would privately undertake this. What we really need to have is maybe 100,000 Christians like this one leader who's willing to say, what was in my area, that's something that God's going to give me to deal with because this is pure religion undefiled to uh, take care of the widows and the orphans. So he is seeing to it in his area. The rest we can see what we can do for other situations and replicate this work. Uh, it is needful that it be replicated. Rush Tooney's book, uh, in his service, deals a lot with this aspect of what to do with the widows and orphans. And the fact that the, uh, the indebtedness, what we should have, of course, with a Christian widow is a situation of uh, debt-free loans. Uh, also, they would have to be, under biblical law, excused after seven years and released. That's what we talked about the very first question. The second question about New Year's resolutions about the seven-year release and also the Jubilee release from debt because debt's a form of uh, slavery and servitude and the scripture is setting forth a pattern that we don't become perpetually indentured. That's why the evil of 10, 20, 30-year mortgages is inherent on the face of it if you look at them. They make you a slave for that long a period of time. Okay, Roman's commentary. Yes, thank you for that also, uh, Roberto. Good comment. You see if there is anything else that popped up in terms of questions. You see, Ground Control has been busy getting my posts in and plus the notice about the uh, Law and Liberty Book of the Month Club discussion. Okay, so at the moment, we have everything dealt with here, which is good. All right, so I'm going to uh, come back and visit uh, this New Year's resolutions a little bit here, too. Met, this is where we have the concept of um, what does it take for us to change our direction and, and to stick with it, right? That is, when you say one thing and do another, and this is the fault. Most people don't have an issue with resolutions except that they fail. The resolution is not kept. Uh, 
and the question is, is the fault in the resolution? Is, the, is it in the making of the resolution? These are all attempts, I think, at uh, self-repentance. That is, a repentance that proceeds from the inside of the, of the human being. As a human being, uh, it is not propelled necessarily Godward or by God. It is something that we purpose for ourselves. We see a weakness or something that we think we need to do better. It might even be that we are aware of a prevailing sin, like a, a temper, a tantrum, an anger. Um, but it's like this. In James, he says, you know, those who lack wisdom, let them ask of God and he will give it. There's certain things that just don't happen by being spinning yourself up into a flurry over them. It's a matter of then bringing God into the picture. He invites us to do this. That's why he says, you know, ask of me and I will give. God will give the wisdom. Uh, most people don't ask of God wisdom, let alone patience, because that's a joke and that can give you exercise your patience rather than simply making it easier for you. He gives you tests because character is always tried character. It's tested. God sits as a refining fire and tests the character. The sons of Levi, we are, uh, read in Malachi 3. These things have purposes for us. Kevin has a question. Let me pull this up. <laughs> I have a grudge and anger issues among some, says Roberto. Well, yeah, that's his, um, there's a such thing as a righteous anger. But you know, it's like this. The um, wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So uh, the other point, of course, is the scriptures say that uh, uh, he who can uh, keep or control his own spirit is mightier than he that takes a city. So it takes some uh, level of effort um, to control one's spirit and not to be consumed with the anger and burn with anger over something. We have the first instance of this when Cain got resentful about Abel and God accepting Abel's offering but not Cain's offering. And uh, sin crouched at the door and took advantage of it. So there is such a thing as a righteous anger and um, that's laid out by Paul clearly enough. He says you can be angry but sin not. There's a way to have a righteous anger and there's a time when you can, in fact, let fly under certain circumstances, but that takes wisdom to know whether it's right or not. I was just commenting with a, a Christian earlier this week about being harsh in writing. And Dr. Reshtuni had uh, written me, I, I had sent him a draft chapter on something, and I, and I went out after a particular person writing on music. And what he, the person wrote was, in fact, ridiculous. There's, there's no question about it. And even Rashtuni saw that, he says, but, he says, never be harsh. He says, only a uh, well-established writer can be harsh, and even then, only sometimes. So, you're better off not being harsh at all. In other words, use an ironic spirit. Um, how would, in the so-called, what would Jesus do situation? Well, we know this, he sometimes would take the cord of three, uh, whip of three cords, but that was not necessarily... Uh, something that happened every day, you know, twice a day, it was fairly rare in comparison to other things. And he basically would apportion his response or his reactions or his, his, what he said to the audience and to the people who needed to hear what he had to say. Whether they were rejected or not is not the point. He was tailoring everything to the audience properly. So we need to be mindful of that too. So let's see what this question was here from Kevin. Are there <coughs> other good book recommendations in the vein of biblical theology like Chilton's work, Paradise Restored, from a post-mill perspective? That's an interesting question. Of course, the great uh, massive book on biblical theology that everyone talks about for a good reason is uh, Gerhardus Voses, and it's amillennial, it's not post-millennial. Uh, in fact, I think that's probably its only flaw. I think Dr. Gary North is right in saying the only issue with it is that the eschatology is pessimistic and all the other regards, it is a very, very powerful, good book. Uh, but I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball in preparing just such a biblical theology uh, that would follow in, say, Vos's footsteps, uh, but then track it in terms of the victory motif from one end of Scripture to the other and not always couch it in terms of uh, pie in the sky by and by as the eschatological victory, but rather victory on earth. Uh, and that is what the promises of the Old Testament are, and all those promises ended up getting short shrift in Vos's work. Uh, and the other problem, of course, is that the work by Chilton has been, right, in my view, rightly criticized by Bonson and others for relying on too much interpretive maximalism, uh, Jim Jordan's approach to scripture, and, and therefore uh, moving beyond the domain of what is legitimate assessment from scripture, that is, uh, what scripture says or a good and necessary inference from it, 
to speculation zone, speculation area, in the interest of various theories that tend to be highly um, speculative. I'm going to come to that word again again, speculative and symbolic, using symbols and pictures and things and motifs to try to establish ideas. And that means that he'll, then you have a form of Gnosticism that arises as a consequence of that. And so uh, when I wrote a critique of Paradise Restored, uh, I made mention of some of the weaknesses in this regard, uh, because he, for example, sees these uh, the this, this stones on the priest's um, shoulder plates, on the breastplate, I should say, and he draws conclusions based on the various things on there and what the symbolism means for these uh, various 12 stones. And uh, he says, and, he can, and therefore he finds himself in conflict with someone else who sees a different meaning for the 12 stones. Now we're talking about a big discussion about what do these different stones mean on a breastplate. Now we're really off in left field at this point when you think about it. Stones on a breastplate, and we're going to get a theology and extract it out of that. And boy, we're going to dig our heels and figure that out. And I thought there was such a simpler meaning to this, uh, and I laid this out in my review. By the way, that review is available because it was reprinted in my article, Reconstructing Postmillennialism, which appears in the Journal for Christian Reconstruction of 1998, Symposium on Eschatology. So uh, toward the end of it, I reproduced virtually the entirety of that argumentation there in that book, in that journal article. Uh, but I'll have to say there are different approaches to how we handle it, and there's simpler ways than to go the path of Jordan interpretive maximalism. I don't believe that we're going to get to a healthy biblical theology going down the speculative path. Uh, Vos limited his and restrained himself in terms of his speculation. That's what made his book sound and powerful. And apart from the millennial pessimism, it was right on the money. Um, and so if we had a post-millennial book, it'd be nice for an amillennialist to read it and say, that's a fantastic biblical theology, except that it's a little bit too optimistic. At least at that point, we know on the core issues, we nailed it, and the issue then becomes is the eschatology. Now what we do, of course, is that we build it organically from Genesis 3, where the protevangelium is announced, all the way through to Revelation 22. So a biblical theology that has a theme of victory must pinpoint that and ride the scriptural wave all the way from beginning to end and to propagate that and promote it. That's what really systematic theologies can do as well, but they, they, uh, they don't do such a good job. By the way, if you're interested in seeing post-millennialism uh, uh, exposited from one end of scripture to the other, one can do worse in Dr. Gentry's book, um, He Shall Have Dominion. Uh, it certainly is a solid post-millennial book, and it does do what it needs to do, which is argue from Scripture. Uh, this s makes it a stronger volume in some respects than Bettner's 1958 volume on the millennium, because some of the arguments that Dr. Bettner put into place looked at current events, and he drew, drew conclusions about how technology was doing wonderful things, etc., etc., uh, and that was a double-edged sword, as has been pointed out by his critics, saying, you know, it can go both ways. Technology can also build a stronger bomb, and, and we use it, too, as a, as a worse bomb or a more potent poison, etc., etc. So all that to say, you need to anchor your post in Scripture exegetically and unapologetically, and that way it cannot be batted around, you can't be knocked off that hill. Like if you stand on Scripture, you can't be knocked off of that. If you're standing on something other than Scripture, or a mixture of Scripture and a theory and Scripture and a speculation, that is shifting ground, uh, and that is the hazard. And sometimes uh, just a little mixture of Scripture can make a speculation sound very plausible. Uh, even Dr. Moorcraft, he, he said something very profound to me, and it, and, it never, and it stuck with me ever since. He said this, talking about the issue of what's a parallel passage is a thing, and here's a parallel passage to this A. B is a parallel passage to A. And he said, well, wait, wait a minute. Not so fast. He says, not all apparent parallels are true parallels. They can look like they're a parallel, but have absolutely nothing to do with it and not be a parallel. So you need to actually dig a little deeper than, well, these things use the exact same words, and I did a grammatical study, and therefore this is a parallel to that. And it was, so what Isaiah is talking about here is also what was referenced to by Micah, and therefore it's a parallel. And therefore it was referenced in Romans 6, it's a parallel. Not necessarily so. You actually have to do more legwork it's not just a gimme. Uh, you need to actually establish it on strong grounds. Then you have that. Okay. The line to Papa. Okay, so you got something for Roger. Good. The title of the book on human rights and the name of the author. 
Okay, yeah, and the, and the author was uh, Robert Ingram. The name of the book is What's Wrong with Human Rights, 1978. Yeah. So, yeah, He Shall Have Dominion. I, I like that, and I think it's a safer read than the Chilton book. Uh, if only David Chilton had lived long enough to, um, unfortunately, if only he hadn't had the the strokes and things like that, that I think affected his reasoning. Uh, that because he reportedly became a full preterist in the last short burst of his life, and uh, Dr. North, I think, is correct in saying he was not in his right mind when that happened, and when that uh, adoption of viewpoint, a shift in view away from orthodoxy arose. Uh, so we have a very skilled writer. We only have the books of his that are in place. What I do know is that uh, he has tended to move away from the Jordan position uh, sufficiently so as to be reconciled to Dr. Rashtuni on a personal level, uh, and that was uh, a positive thing. But then things changed for each of us. I had the, the pleasure of meeting uh, David Chilton, and we had some very good discussions. Uh, we have, have a lot in common, but we certainly have our difference of opinion. And we do not yet all see eye to eye. That point in time that's referred to in the book of Isaiah, and I, when his Zion shall see eye to eye, has not yet come upon us. Therefore, it behooves us to do the necessary legwork, not to be, to be workmen approved, not ashamed. And every book written by human beings, even the best by some of the theologians up there on the shelf, there's some point where, yes, they are, were not a workman approved on some of the points they made. They were workman ashamed um, because they're produced by humans. The only book, book that lacks that flaw is the Bible itself because it's God's own work and not the work of fallible humans. Nonetheless, it's our obligation to continue to labor so that Zion shall see eye to eye and that the truth shall be victorious, which is the whole mission and purpose for what we exist here. So we're heading that direction. But I cannot recommend any so-called biblical theology today that uh, by that name that I could say is post-millennial. I don't think there's only one that's worthy of the name um, that is, uh, exists, which is the Vos one. Do not be fooled <laughs> by the book called Biblical Theology by the famous Puritan John Owen. You say, well, there's a guy who's pretty post-millennial. That is true. And the book is titled Biblical Theology. That's also true. But that doesn't mean the book is a biblical theology. It is not. It is something else. Uh, I don't know why they picked that title for the 17th volume of his completed works. It was translated into English for the first time in 1994 uh, by Stephen Westcott. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful volume, and I get a lot of great stuff out of it, but it is not a biblical theology, despite the huge word letters that are an inch and a half tall of biblical theology on the cover. It's simply the stuff that wasn't covered in the 16 volumes over here on the other side of my room, uh, the collected works of John Owen. So... It is a post list. It got the right title, but the content doesn't qualify. All right, how are we doing on time, ground control? I always have a bad handle on uh, on our timing. We might have 20 minutes left. We might have gone over it by two minutes. I never know. But ground control, let me know momentarily, and then we can proceed based on that. And if any other questions pop up, I'll obviously try to take them. And again, a reminder: if you can scroll up, you can see that there is a call for. Uh, Law and Liberty, uh, Book of the Month Club discussion tomorrow with Chris Zimmerman and Andrea Schwartz. Highly recommended. Very, very powerful book. Uh, I still think the discussion, I think, is on page 39. 12 minutes ago. Well, we got some time to, um, to kill or to uh, make it productive. So what we need to do, of course, is to um, uh, improve the time because the days are evil, right? To redeem the time because the days are evil. Therefore, the next 12 minutes should be used for positive, constructive things. It will help me do that if you have questions that you'd like me to deal with. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to the ones we've already had and uh, elaborate some further on them. So if you're content with that, I'm happy to do it. But it's nice to get into some new material as well, starting here in the first of the year. Oh, uh, I guess I can make an interesting announcement. Uh, I have been asked to participate, and perhaps even be the lead speaker, at a conference on abuse in uh, Alabama, yeah, the tail end of April, and they're still setting up all the details, but I've agreed to be a speaker at that event. So that to me is important, be that uh, Christian Reconstructionists get out ahead on this topic and actually start to lead. Instead of being reactive, as we said in the earlier question, be proactive. Go out there and articulate the solutions and the problems. And I think Dr. Estrin did a great service starting this process with his book, The Cure of Souls. 
But we need to go beyond that because the problem has worsened since that book was written and published and is continuing to get worse as we go. And probably the, one of the worst things about it is that the wrong solutions are being proffered up. Humanistic solutions are being proffered up. Uh, and what happens, of course, is that this is actually compounding a sin with additional violation of God's requirements. And you therefore again frame mischief using law. Uh, or, in this instance, you have people, instead of taking what the Bible requires, they will articulate their own solutions and uh, baptize it with a little Christian verbiage. Um, as folks who, and perhaps Ground Control can put this up, when I first published heavily on this art uh, topic, it was in the article Liberty from Abuse, some six years old at this point. Yes, I'll remember that too. Thank you, Ground Control. Uh, Liberty from Abuse, where I pointed out that I did a massive study on Ezekiel 34th chapter in particular, and the 10th verse in particular, in particular, focusing down to this key little element in that verse, which talks about the shepherds uh, that are harmful, uh, that harm the sheep. And one of the, the key points is that they shall no longer feed themselves uh, on the flock. In other words, they, it, it is not going to be a paid position anymore. Uh, to say the least. You know, that's simply, uh, they're being totally cashiered, as one of the commentators said. They are put out to pasture and are not, no, no longer allowed. And the teaching, therefore, in Ezekiel 34 is with the pastoral position, positions of spiritual authority, one strike and you're out. Not three strikes, you're out, or we're going to keep, uh, I have horrible books on the thing, on my library talking about <clears throat> how do we restore our spiritual fallen leaders. And you don't. That's, uh, that's what you're supposed, that's the biblical answer in Ezekiel 34. But people set aside scripture and talk about New Testament forgiveness, but forgiveness always has to follow what the Bible requires. And you cannot simply um, loosen what God binds. You cannot do that. If God says they shall not, and the scripture cannot be broken, then you cannot pit uh, one consideration, which is the personal level, against what God requires. So we're going to certainly be dealing with the complexities of abuse at church level, at family level, um, individual level, uh, at this conference, details forthcoming. Because again, I think I, I just accepted the speakership just two or three weeks ago um, to speak at this conference, which is being put together very, very quickly. But why are they putting it together quickly? Because the need is intense. I credit them for saying, what can we do? Can we get a speaker here who could uh, give some uh, some value and some biblical light in a tough topic? And it's a tough topic, and it's tough because we've not dealt with it, and therefore it is alien to us, and that's on us for not having dealt with it, as we ought to have done in the past. Here is that article. Let me pin this uh, thing from Dr. from Roger Oliver. Marcy asks about the paradox of an untimely death, for example, by murder or medical malpractice, and that God has our days numbered. So uh, even the circumstance in Psalm 90 when he says, um, apply your hearts to wisdom because all your days are numbered, that includes the fact that you might have a so-called untimely death. And uh, there's... There's a passage in Isaiah that maybe sometimes applies to this, and it should concern us that this Isaiah passage might apply to us. Where is it? Ah, 57th chapter of Isaiah, first couple of verses. Huh. And if you're not frightened by this verse, you should be, these verses. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorcerers, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom do ye make a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood, and flaming yourselves with idols, etc., etc.? So you see, there's evil to come. By evil to come, it's referring to cultural evil. Uh, it could be spiritual evil. It could be physical evil. It could be moral evil. But the point is that when we say, ah, oh, they, they died so young, you know, the question is, you don't not, are not laying it to heart. And that's the complaint that Isaiah is saying. He says, they pass away, they're taken away, merciful men are taken away, and none layeth it to heart, none considering or understanding or looking deeper at it and saying, they are taken away from the evil to come. They did not have to live to see something horrible happen. Like Josiah did not happen to get to see something horrible to happen to Israel. He was gathered to his fathers after he was uh, killed in the Carchemish 
uh, preemptive war that he started, and that was his fault, and self-inflicted death. Nonetheless, he was spared to see evil to come against Israel. So, uh, there is no inconsistency because uh, even the case of Josiah, his days were numbered, but his days were numbered such that he died in the middle of a sin that he was committing by launching an attack against uh, Nico Pharaoh Egypt when it was not his business. He actually was violating the rules of war in Deuteronomy 17. He also was told by the uh, envoy from the Pharaoh saying, what have you to do with me, O king of Israel or Judah? Uh, I'm, 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 God has sent me to smite Carchemish. And here again, uh, the king of Judah refused to believe that God would work through a Gentile. Zzz, wrong answer. God works through anyone he wants. He can speak through the ass of a donkey in a donkey's mouth to bail him if he wants and gets a message across. So, uh, okay, and uh, murder and malpractice. Of course, murders, uh, victim, what happens, of course, if you become a victim of a murder or you're, and all the um, slain of God, they uh, aggregate and are in fellowship under the altar of God in Revelation 6, verse 9, 10, 11. They're given white linen robes as they cried, How long, O Lord, before you avenge us of our, those who, who struck us down? And they're given the white robe and told to wait a microcrona on a little season while their brothers, brethren run their race. Now, that word to complete is to finish a race, a dromos. So the same idea and language expressed elsewhere by Paul. Five minutes left. Thank you. So uh, it is always uh, tragic to because... We, especially if you are so focused on the human domain that to you death is the end of everything. It's not. In Romans eight nineteen to 23, we read that everything is scheduled to be uh, pulled out of the grave and restituted. Uh, Rushdoney, in his commentary on Romans, mentions that Calvin even took that, uh, that regeneration of all things, putting back together again from the dead, to include not just men and animals, uh, but also plants and the mineral kingdom. After all, the mineral kingdom is also subjected to futility and subjected in hope of him who subjected it, no less so than plants, animals, and, and people. It decays, it rusts, it rots, and that's going to stop too, so that uh, it's put on a foundation that's very, very different than before. And uh, so the uh, it'll be a different kind of tree, the tree of life that lines the river in Revelation toward the end. So a lot to be said on this context. All right, five minutes. Oh, yeah, and I wanted to say, do remember Chalcedon in your giving as the Lord leads, as the ground control points out, at chalcedon.edu slash give. Uh, we, our work that we do is basically made possible by your promotion of it and by your support of it, uh, which we covet in a godly way, <laughs> obviously, uh, and we are very cautious to use it for uh, the tasks that are ahead of us. Uh, and I think it's going, obviously we have a very difficult year in many respects, but you know, God is not mocked. When all the, the, um, there's a passage that Dr. Rishtani liked. It's in Psalm 24. He's probably one of the few people who took the passage in the way he did, but he's onto something here. Famous 24 Psalm. We usually know it because, oh yeah, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we use this in terms of its quotation in 1 Corinthians 10 and elsewhere. Uh, indicative that, of course, uh, the world does not belong to the devil, etc., etc. It belongs to God. But the second verse is the interesting one that Dr. Rushtuni glommed onto, and for good reason. Pay attention. For he, the Lord, hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now that's interesting. He says, what does this mean? Well, floods and seas are in continual motion. They're unstable. There is no stability. The earth is fundamentally in an unstable state. Uh, it is like a kingdom built on shifting sand, right? So the only thing, the only place that is stable, that is truly the rock, is the capital R rock. He established earth upon the flood. So we don't find stability in the things of this world. We find only our stability in God. And this is why Moses says their rock is not like our rock. And the King James translators wisely capitalized the second R for our rock, the rock of our salvation. God is a rock unto us that uh, we can anchor to and safely do so. And so Chalcedon, what we do, of course, is we're interested in promoting the rock as the foundation of everything, from social order to education uh, to the church at large as well, which is also in desperate need of the light of God. The Puritans were smarter than we are because we tend to think we've arrived, and the Puritans made it very clear 
that they had not. They made it uh, abundantly clear and said, as God has uh, so chosen his word, or is that he may shine further light upon the word. So if God shines further light upon our word, meaning our blindness is starting to disappear, we look at the scripture and say, aha, missed that one, time to apply that. And so we, the whole point of uh, Semper Reformanda, of always reforming, is that you're gaining more light and understanding, but you're not going to get that unless you're deep, digging deep into the Word and extracting out of it what it has. So we need to bring forth out of our um, purse treasures, both old and new, ancient and modern. And part of this is going to be getting the valuable stuff from the Word of God, because it is the rock that we can trust and faith in. So I think we've covered all our bases. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Ground Control, for another wonderful session, our first session for 2019. I think it ended well. It ended at least on time, as opposed to overtime like last week. So uh, no, I will keep no uh, New Year's resolution about ending on time. I'm wiser than that. So blessings to all. We'll see you next week. God bless.